So yes, we're back with the breakfast, uh, with the first conversation, it's about unemployment and the fact that uh, unemployment rate in Nigeria is set to hit uh, 40 or 41 point percent. Now, according to reports from the KPMG, it says that the Nigerian unemployment rate had increased to 37.7% in 2022 and will further increase to 40.6% due to the continuing inflow of job seekers into the labor market. The multinational consulting firm in its newly released report said unemployment will continue to be a challenge due to the slower than uh, required economic growth and instability of the economy to absorb uh, 4 to 5 million new uh, entrance into the uh, Nigerian job market every other year. Now, although the National Bureau of Statistics recorded an increase in the national unemployment rate from 23.1% uh, in 2018 to 33.3% in uh, 2020, it estimates that this rate has increased to 37.7% in 2022 and will further increase to 40.6% in 2023. The report also said that, you know, in 2024, the un unemployment rate will continue to grow to 43%, while inflation will accelerate to 20.3% uh, in 2023 and 20.0% in 2024. We, we have um, a guest joining us this morning, Kelvin Emmanuel, who is an economist and CEO of Diary Hills uh, in the FCT. Kelvin, it's good to have you join us this morning. Many thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, when we have reports saying that unemployment rate would actually uh, further increase to 40.6%, uh, what does that really mean? Well, that means that um, production is um, tethering. The cost of capital is um, high. You can see that from the recent uh, report that um, the rate is up to 37.7% and is expected to go up to about 40.6% in 2023. And um, you can see that Unilever Nigeria, for example, has written to the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the NGX, about its plans to take off some products out of the market. Interestingly, the debate is raging about the reason why Unilever would do that. But I'll tell you categorically that Unilever is finding difficult to source for enterprise products from outside Nigeria for its manufacturing line. It's finding difficult to repatriate FX, and it's been forced to shut down some of its products. It has nothing to do with competition because some people are alleging that it's because of so much competition. And the question I have for you, for them, is how those legacy products that the company has spent billions marketing over the years and has become household names be subject of competition battle in the detergent space. Um, so detergent, it's, it's, it's unimaginable. So, you know, when they claw back production, jobs are lost. And the per capita income of Nigerians has gone down nearly 50% over the last eight years. So it's a complete disaster, coupled with the fact that um, the government is saying that it wants to, it has borrowed um, $800 million from the International Development Association, an arm of the World Bank, um, through pledging SDR from its um, stock of SDR with the IMF special dry rights as a collateral for that loan. Um, so it, it's a very messy situation because, you know, the, uh, this government has shown over time that it lacks um, the willpower, it lacks the framework through which it can identify the private sector to create jobs and, you know, keep people in employment and keep the per capita income high. It's shown it, and the last eight years have been a complete disaster because no economic indicator has, you know, pointed positive or has shown growth. I expect that in the Q2 GDP report, IMF says they're expecting it to be about 3.2%. I expect that GDP report will show 28 to 2.9%, which is a contraction, you know, and when your um, population is growing faster than your GDP, that is an indication of a recession. So, but um, 
then again, what could be responsible for this continuous um, you know, increase in the unemployment rate. For instance, uh, the National Bureau of Statistics had recorded uh, some sort of increase at the time in 2018. It was at 23.1% to about 33%. So what are the indices? What are the indicators that over time we seem to be on the high? Uh, despite government policies, despite, you know, social intervention programs and what have you, we seem to be, you know, uh, going on with the uh, higher statistics. And also, it's uh, according to this report in 2014, it probably might not just be different because we might just get it a little bit higher with what we might experience in 2023. Yeah, I, I've never believed in social investment programs. They give, they empower the uh, school, school feeding program and conditional cash transfer. I, I, I keep saying it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because people don't need you to give them fish. You need to teach them how to catch fish. And the way you can do that is incentivize the private sector and make it, in fact, NARA exam policy was responsible for really, really wiping off the, a, lot, a, a, a substantial part of the informal economy because so many micro businesses shut down. So many micro businesses that eat between 5,000 to 5 million, they shut down. You know, and these are the people who create about 50 to 60% of the jobs. So, you know, when you have a situation where people's businesses, the person who sells fruit or the person who does POS vending machine, you notice very well if you go there that quite a number of the POS vendors are not back in business. Despite the fact that um, the CBN was compelled by the Supreme Court to allow Five five hundred and one thousand naira notes back, you know, those POS vending points created more than a hundred thousand jobs around Nigeria. So you can imagine a substantial part of them taking off the markets. Those people were you know, like earning. Those people were people who owned the POS vending points were earning five six hundred thousand naira per month. The people who worked for them were earning 40, 50,000 naira per month. They were creating jobs above minimum wage. Those people have been taken off the market. The person who sells fruits, the person who sells uh, provision, the person who sells um, rice, you know, in retail, they, they, they were taken off the market. You know, so it, it's difficult for you to um, understand the employment indices if you don't focus on the informal economy. Because the informal economy were the most impacted by the scarcity of Naira notes. You know, and then you can see that reflect in the job numbers. So um, just before we begin to look at uh, the solution, you have talked about paying attention to the informal economy. But then again, um, i like us to, you know, put statistics like with numbers now. So if we say that there's a possibility of having 41% of, uh, you know, the population uh, unemployed, what does that really mean? How many million persons are we looking at, uh, you know, at the end of the day? And what's the implication of this for our economy, especially our security? Well, you have to consider that um, about between, like, uh, if you look at the population from 21 to about 40, within that band, you have maybe 45% of Nigerians, um, you have a Gen Z that has just come on to the labor force. So when you say 40.6% 40, 40 uh, 40 unemployment rates, underemployment, you're looking at um, maybe somewhere around maybe 60 million of the working population that is out of the markets. And this doesn't speak well about insecurity because if you look at the budget for education, you notice that the budget for education, the personnel to CAPEX ratio um, is very high. The budget for education is 4.9% of the 2023 Appropriation Act. And I always say that if you ignore education, you are going to breed insecurity because whatever you don't pay for in education, you pay for in defense. 
And if you can see there is a direct correlation between the fact that there is a high, there is a high literacy rate in the North and the insecurity in the North. It's not rocket science. There are states in the North where illiteracy rate is somewhere around 85 to 88%. Yeah. Look at the correlation with um, the insecurity in the North. So you, you have to understand that because the government has failed to focus its budget on the key metrics, education, for example, right? According to the Abuja declaration that the government signed, it says that it's going to adopt the UNESCO standard of focusing 15% of its budget on education since 2010. Under President Buhari, that has gone down by about 3 to 4% to 4.98%, right? And you can see very well that it has an impact in the inability of the government in 2022 to pay ASU. Some people last year dropped out of school because of the strike. You know, some people moved abroad. You, you begin to see that our inability to focus on investing in education because you cannot pay lecturers their salary, they, don't, they are not motivated and incentivized to teach properly. It has an impact. And going forward, you know, you, you know, we said we were going to talk about the solutions. Going forward, see, you you need to change the structure fundamentally because it's my belief that we, we, looking at the structure of the budget where you have 29% in sinking fund that is going into refinancing and paying interest on debt, and you have somewhere around 31.5% going into paying PMS subsidy, even if PMS subsidy is going to be removed in the... Um, third quarter of 2023, the government needs to understand that for it to fund education, it needs to change the structure of education in Nigeria, the administration of education, that fund, the NUC, the Ministry of Education. Something needs to fundamentally change. Okay? Because government alone cannot fund quality education. Two million Nigerians going into the university system on a yearly basis. It's not practicable with a budget that is 4.9% uh, of 20, 21 .8 trillion naira. It's not possible. It's just not working. The government needs to accept that this model we've had where um, you have students paying 19,000 naira, even if it's come up for debate over time, 19,000 naira, 15,000 naira, um, 40,000 naira school fees annually, it's just not working. It's not working. You can't you can't teach somebody how to be an engineer or how to be a medical doctor or how to be an architect that will compete with his mates in the UK and in America or in Singapore, or South Korea with 40,000. It's just it's just not practicable. We need to sit down and have an early consensus on how to change the structure fundamentally of this economy. Mm. Now talking about changing the structure of uh, you know the economy. Uh, you have mentioned education as, uh, you know, a key pointer uh, and some sort of government policy in terms of budgeting to whether education will help. But again, let's also look at, you know, the type of education that we offer. Now, and I know that uh, we're very big on the conventional university, and so people just go in there and just get a degree. But yes, we probably might just have, you know, the vocational institution. But don't you think that um, we, there might just be need to pay attention to in the bid to address this issue of unemployment to, you know, have more attention paid to vocational education where people can literally um, get to learn a lot about maybe skills, acquiring more skills, um, technical skills that can actually help solve day-to-day -day problems, uh, carpentry, what have you, and all the stuff rather than con the continued, um, you know, uh, having more conventional universities across the different parts of the country. I, I, I absolutely subscribe to that. In fact, I believe that we need to revive vocational education because, and this is the reason why the polytechnics were created in the first place, but we lost the plot along the way. The polytechnics were not created to have students sit in lecture rooms and write notes. The polytechnics were created to see 
how they could simulate vocational training for students, carpentry, tiling, upholstery, um, different kinds of vocational skills, um, hairdressing, uh, makeup, you know, different kinds of vocational skills. There are makeup artists today who make to um, hundred thousand naira per day. You know, I, I don't see why you have an economy where people feel that the person who um, is a medical doctor is more prestigious and is a better human being than the person who is a makeup artist or the person who is a carpenter. You know, it's in Nigeria where Nigeria people discriminate against plumbers. But when you travel to London and you ask a plumber to come fix something in your house and he gives you a bill and tells you that your bill is 600 pounds, you, you begin to think again. And you begin to ask yourself if the plumber is even any better than some medical doctors and nurses in the UK. You know, so we need to mainstream vocational training in polytechnics. That's the reason why vocation and polytechnics were created. Polytechnics, were, like I said, were not created to have people sit down in lecture rooms and write notes. And at the end of the day, they come out and what they learned in school does not have any marketplace value, which is what you see today. You've also talked about it. I know you have mentioned the uh, metrics of uh, <clears throat> what sort of metrics that we need to pay attention to. So what are the key metrics that government need to pay attention to? You have different stakeholders, the private sector, as well as citizens of the country. So um, we're able to get out of this quagmire that we're in. First of all, the government needs to raise revenue to GDP ratio from 7.5%. The government needs to restructure its debt. It needs to stop borrowing from the central bank so that you will not have continuous Naira devaluation that has affected the um, cost of importation because Naira devaluation makes it more expensive to import for companies and contributes to inflation, which is what you've seen over the last four years especially. The government needs to change its medium-term expenditure framework and reallocate the structure of its budget. In my opinion, I think the government needs to focus 30% of its budget from 2024 on education and healthcare. Healthcare is also 4.98% of 21.8 trillion. And the personnel to CAPEX ratio, it's, it's abysmal. You know, the personnel to CAPEX ratio is about 2.7 times the CAPEX with a um, ministry overhead of 22.4%. The government needs to um, focus on ensuring that it can reduce the amount of circulation of cash in the system to reduce cost push inflation. And it can work on backward integration for key sectors to focus on reducing demand pull inflationary buffers. If it gets that inflation number down below 20%, the interest, the MPR will begin to come down. The MPR, MPR begins to come Alvin, down. I'm sorry that I, um, we have to come in at this point. I'm told that we have less than two minutes to go at this point. But I then think that, um, let me ask you quickly if you think that if subsidy is removed in June, do you think that this would also, uh, do you know, tinger with the figure of, Unemployment. I mean, also real time. Would it also affect, you know, the figure that we have now, looking at forty one percent? Do you think that that would also impact on uh, unemployment rate uh, as it is? Would there be an increase? Are we expected to ex experience a decrease? What do you think would happen with that exact policy? If you remove PMS subsidy and Dangote refinery does not start immediately before you remove it, petrol prices will go to a dollar five cents per liter. I'm expecting somewhere between 782 and 790 naira per liter. If Dangote starts, 27% of the cost of handling it will be taken off because that's the cost, that's what it costs to land PMS in Nigeria. So you're going to bring PMS um, to somewhere around 580 naira. Maybe when it's taken out of the refinery depot you have somewhere around 600 naira. So it definitely is going to contribute to inflation and it might even price some people out of business. You know, um, the plan, like I said, that the government has of giving out 10,000 naira per month, between seven and 10,000 naira per month as palliative is completely, um, no, it is not going to have any impact whatsoever. Um, you know, if there was time, I would have talked about what the government should have invested that $800 million in. So at this point, 
<clears throat> so at this point, are you saying that we are expecting to have a lot of people out of you know uh, their jobs? People will be jobless. Will people lose? Especially their jobs? in the informal side of the economy, I'm expecting that the price of PMS will price them out of the markets because they, they especially in the service sector, um, people won't be able to produce at um, a reasonable price for the people who patronize them to afford them. So they will be priced out of the market. We have to go at this point. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Uh, Emmanuel, we've had a great conversation this morning and we can't stop. We can continue to talk about these issues as we proceed. Thanks for having me. All right, then that's the size of it this morning. On the first segment, we take a break. When we return, our concern would be on the issue of the elections. I mean, the elections have come and gone, but the issues with the elections or from the elections have not ended. I'm sure that we'll continue to talk about this up until, you know, the end of 2023 or further. Uh, we'll just be looking at the fact that INEC is saying that electronic collision of results are not compulsory. Uh, that is in response to the APP uh, political party that had questioned the credibility of their election. Please stay with us. We'll be right back.